Hello everyone. Very good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening uh, to all the participants coming across the world. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar series hosted by P Manifold in association with uh, Energy Savings Trust. Uh, this is a little unique series uh, uh, topic of today. Uh, we are clubbing uh, two of our webinar uh, series, uh, which is India and Global Charging Ahead, which is e-mobility focus series, and the other uh, low voltage uh, DC uh, global uh, series. So this particular theme of e-mobility applied to rural transportation, uh, we are covering under this uh, two topics. Uh, I would also want to take a uh, very quick uh, intro uh, and launch of a new initiative. We are calling it Hash Grow EVs in Rural. This is a joint initiative between P Manifold and Energy Savings Trust. And as it uh, appears, the whole idea of uh, uh, this collaboration, uh, starting with this uh, first webinar uh, topic today and future series, also with uh, some uh, on ground pilots and projects uh, in India and Africa. We really want to develop uh, use cases of EVs uh, uh, in rural uh, and make e-mobility penetrate uh, this domain. So let's understand like uh, uh, what we have in for uh, today's discussion. Uh, the first question that arises is like, why are we talking for EVs in rural when we are struggling with EVs uh, in the urban? and the current penetration is uh, quite low. Even globally, it is uh, less than a percent. So why are we talking for EVs in uh, rural? So I want to just share some statistics from India. Our other uh, fellow speaker, Shanta uh, from Africa, uh, she can collaborate, corroborate uh, uh, some stats from uh, Africa. So in India, if you see the rural contribution uh, to motorcycles, demand is uh, 50% and uh, small car demand in rural it's uh, of high order of 33 uh, and above percentage if you see the uh, uh, market share of uh, leading uh, automakers in two wheelers if you take hero motor Corp, almost 50 50 percent uh, of their portfolio distribution between urban and rural if you take a uh, uh, light passenger segment leader maruti almost 40% uh, uh, portfolio of them goes into the rural. And uh, if you look into Mahindra and Mahindra with their combination uh, portfolio uh, between uh, four wheelers and also tractors, almost 50% uh, uh, goes in uh, uh, rural. So the market leaders uh, in automotives in India, they have sizable minimum kind of of the order of 40% uh, 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 share market share coming from the rural. So I think the automotive market in rural is uh, definitely very exciting. More so in the current COVID times, I'm sure you all are catching up with the news uh, that uh, in the hard times of COVID, it's basically the rural consumption that is uh, keeping uh, the automotive markets on higher growth rates. In fact, uh, compared to even the uh, last year, similar months, uh, the demand coming primarily from the rural uh, is uh, creating actually a, uh, a spike uh, and a push uh, and a pressure on the supply system. So from that angle, the rural economy is uh, very important. Uh, very quick stats, uh, again for India, 70% uh, households is rural. It contributes 30% to the GDP. I already talked almost 40% uh, new automotive sales are happening in rural. 40% of total electricity consumption uh, uh, goes into the rural, but revenue contribution from this energy to the DISCOM is on the uh, lower side, given subsidies and other losses associated with the rural. And 70% contribution to total transport demand actually originates from rural uh, logistics and uh, transports. So I think like uh, the numbers are definitely uh, uh, very high uh, in favor of rural. And uh, hence, I think the market really needs to be uh, looked into and uh, not uh, being getting discounted. So with that, 
I also quickly want to share some of the top questions. Uh, I would also label them as little myths, but of course I would not discount like they are challenges which we need to solve if we intend to grow EVs in the uh, rural. First, what are the use cases in rural for EVs conversion that we are talking? Uh, I think uh, the panel today is uh, really covering uh, Asia and Africa. Uh, we will see two uh, very good use cases of uh, uh, three wheelers and tractors. Again, a very hard and uh, power intensive uh, high power application but being driven fully on uh, electric. And there is much more, like in terms of uh, uh, the motorbike, uh, the two wheelers, which really goes most into the rural, uh, gets used for both passenger and uh, uh, goods carrying and more attachments to the two wheelers, uh, kind of adding as a uh, load carrying vehicles. So there are many use cases in rurals that can be looked into for uh, uh, EVs conversion. The second point, uh, which is very pertinent is like, can rural afford EVs? We know the willingness to pay and uh, uh, the pressures. So can they afford to uh, uh, EVs when urban is uh, struggling? So I think the, uh, rather than taking a very generic view into it, uh, again, I would say that uh, our uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, and panelists today will show you that how a smart uh, design and tapping into a right market with a right business model is actually making EVs uh, affordable than uh, counterpart uh, uh, diesel or uh, petrol options. So I think uh, the answer lies in uh, a combination of uh, uh, robust EVs, uh, a robust uh, uh, battery system and charging ecosystem and a very integrated business model and they exist they exist in small pockets and uh, the challenge would be like how do we make it uh, mainstream for uh, uh, rurals third can rural weak grid support evs charging i think this question is uh, on top of uh, uh, mind for pretty much most of us and i think it's a good question we understand that uh, our discom uh, uh, companies operating in rural are uh, struggling uh, with the viability of uh, power distribution uh, mainly arising from very uh, spread geography of rural and uh, very low load density so that makes the overall capex investments high and opex costs uh, very high and then challenge with uh, some of the uh, associated government subsidies cross subsidization of tariff uh, the discoms really uh, uh, bleed in the rural so how we can develop a model uh, possibly more uh, decentralized uh, grids uh, using some of existing microgrids. So again, here we have uh, a, a panelist who will share uh, uh, his experience and uh, uh, a potential uh, use case of uh, uh, EVs getting charged in existing microgrids. Uh, so that we will discuss like how the weak grid in rurals uh, can, can be uh, uh, improved uh, for uh, EV applications. And uh, last point, can robust EV supply chain be built in uh, rural? Uh, I think many of uh, uh, usually high technology pieces are kind of challenged like uh, uh, if uh, a good uh, uh, sales, distribution, uh, post-sale services could really be built. Uh, my take here would be like, uh, if we can build a strong uh, after sales for a much complex uh, tractor kind of an equipment or a truck kind of equipment in rural, then EVs given their uh, uh, low parts, higher reliability, I think that supply chain uh, could be easily built with uh, existing uh, uh, service uh, uh, capabilities of rural. So I think that uh, could be solved. Yes, all these pieces really need to be uh, integrated strong for a strong uh, business model and implementations. Uh, just want to very quickly say like, uh, what, what are the different uh, use cases we are talking uh, uh, in rural? Uh, it starts from two-wheeler going to three-wheeler, uh, cars, uh, buses are already servicing rural uh, geographies and uh, very uniquely uh, tractors. So I think these are existing modes which are quite heavily uh, used in uh, rural 
and here in this individual charts you can see like uh, a uh, uh, for the usage in that segment what is the typical uh, kilometers that is getting traveled uh, uh, in the rural so in case of uh, 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 you will see uh, uh, for two wheelers uh, uh, more percentage uh, uh, are covering uh, less than 10 kilometers yeah so uh, that that becomes important similar in case of three wheelers so two wheelers three wheelers almost 60 percent of the trips are uh, uh, less than say uh, 10 kilometers but then when you start going to cars and buses then more and more trips are happening uh, greater than uh, uh, 10 kilometers so i think uh, this uh, ridership of rural uh, will also be an important criteria to develop a right uh, fleet models with a right total cost of ownership of uh, EVs uh, uh, applied to it. Uh, let's understand very quickly what we want to cover in webinar today. Uh, we will cover existing transport landscape, uh, the suitability of EVs for those uh, different uh, use cases in rural. We will understand the opportunities and barriers of taking EVs to the rural what business models uh, have succeeded and what are challenges faced and finally the piece of integrating e-mobility with uh, local energy supply and improving also the energy access so with that uh, uh, i welcome uh, our speakers uh, of today i i i, I really call them uh, very brave uh, entrepreneurs uh, who are taking already a difficult topic uh, but definitely opportunistic uh, to a, uh, I would say, like uh, more challenge scenario and settings of uh, rural. So we have uh, Shanta Blumen. Uh, she is director mobility for Africa, and uh, Shanta will share uh, uh, her very uh, brave uh, 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 entrepreneurship uh, in Africa, uh, where she has uh, developed uh, 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 renewable transport solutions. Uh, serving rural and peri-urban uh, uh, communities and especially working uh, uh, with uh, women. Uh, so welcome Shanta. Then we have uh, Siddharth Durai Rajan. Siddharth is co-founder uh, Celestial E-Mobility. It's a startup uh, uh, based out of Hyderabad and uh, he and his uh, team have uh, already developed and tested a six horsepower electric tractor which they claim to be equivalent to a uh, 21 horsepower diesel tractor. Uh, and uh, more over and above, they have developed a battery swapping model uh, for it. And uh, they are planning a uh, e-hut uh, kind of a model where community charging can take place at Gram Panchayat level. So we will hear Siddharth uh, sharing his exciting uh, uh, innovation around uh, tractor. And uh, third, uh, where does power comes from uh, Shanta and Siddharth? So the answer to that, uh, uh, we want to hear from uh, Colonel Vijay Bhaskar. Uh, he is uh, ex-army uh, staff uh, and he was ex-country director for uh, Amlinda Foundation, uh, running multiple uh, uh, microgrids in uh, Jharkhand uh, and an expert on uh, energy access and uh, microgrid solutions. So uh, we, we, we are excited to hear from uh, Vijay uh, what could be potential business models uh, to take away worries of uh, e-mobility uh, fleet operators uh, uh, operating in uh, rural. And uh, 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 with the welcome of the speakers, I also want to introduce a, a co-moderator with me, uh, Ms. Richa Goyal. She's Senior Insight Manager at Energy Savings Trust. Uh, she has 11 years of experience working in energy space, uh, energy access uh, program and operate business development and uh, research. She leads uh, low energy inclusive uh, appliances program at uh, Energy Savings Trust. With this, uh, I request uh, Richa uh, to further kind of share uh, uh, a little bit about EST work in energy access and uh, what we are looking to work uh, together in rural e-mobility. Richard. Thanks, Rahul. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yes, Richard. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so Rahul did an amazing job as usual to set a very good and uh, high-level context. 
um, what I'm going to do is, and can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, Yamini, will you share Rita's presentation, please? What, we, what I'll do is that I'll very, very briefly talk about who we are, uh, just so people get familiar with EST and the LEA program. Um, and then I'm going to talk about two topics, which is the emerging startup landscape in rural Africa and in, um, in micromobility, um, and then business models uh, with a focus on achieving circular economy and resiliency. I think uh, in terms of business models, you can look at business models in a number of ways. You can look at it from a purely economics point of view and you, you can look at it from a grid viability point of view. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on the more climate kind of payoffs uh, just in line with uh, you know the upcoming COP and the climate change uh, urgency. So with that, uh, on who we are, EST is an independent, impartial, non-profit distributing organization dedicated to promote, promoting energy efficiency, low carbon transport, and sustainable energy use. And in the energy access sector, EST co-manages with our partner, partner class, the Low Energy Inclusive Appliances Program, or the LEA program, which is a five-year research and innovation program that seeks to double the efficiency and half the cost of a range of electrical appliances suited for off and V grid applications. EST also serves as the co-secretariat for the Efficiency for Access Coalition, which is a global coalition bringing together a lot of donors and partners working to promote high performing appliances that, uh, uh, that enable access to clean energy. Now within the LEA program, EST co-leads the research uh, and I'm the research co-lead for the LEA program and, and the Efficiency for Access Coalition. It leads the program m &E, it also manages the delivery of the E4A R&D fund, uh, and we also manage the E4A design challenge for university students. Next slide, next slide, please. So uh, when we look at the emerging landscape of, uh, in, of there, there's already a host of activity in this space, by the way, whether or not it, it is connected to energy access practitioners directly is another question but it's certainly slowly emerging. In the last five years, a varied number of e-mobility startups have mushroomed across Africa and India. This startup activity is predominant in the micro-mobility segment, so electric bikes, scooters, three-wheelers, and the likes, serving the commuting transport and light cargo transportation use cases. Uh, the focus on two and light three-wheeler segments is not without reason. Rahul explained with some of, some of the numbers. They are high impact, high volume segments. They also make up the low cost EV solutions market. Um, these segments also offer opportunity for utilizing off the shelf available components for production. And in many cases, local manufacturing beyond just local assembly using imported knockdown kits from China, they, they can also give a second life to existing ICE models by converting them to their electric versions, for example, uh, in turn creating potential for local skilling and job creation. So uh, these are also the segments where low-income households can become early EV adopters, simultaneously bridging last mile connectivity. Uh, furthermore, these segments are quite ubiqu ubiquitous in Africa and India already. So in East Africa, Boda Boda or motorcycle taxis and tuk-tuks or auto rickshaws are amongst the most popular alternatives for ferrying commuters and goods for small businesses. The Boda Boda sector is one of the largest employers of youth in Kenya and Uganda. Similarly, a, a statistic I found in the Niti Aayog report, uh, Rahul also alluded to this, a substantial, almost 80% of vehicles on, on road in India are estimated to be two-wheelers. Um, interestingly, the Indian two-wheeler manufacturers, particularly Bajaj Auto and TVS Motors, they comprise almost half of the two-wheeler export market to Africa. Uh, which is almost neck to neck with the share of ch uh, share from Chinese exporters into Africa, a market dynamic which also offers opportunities for global south south cooperation between Africa and India in 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 the two wheeler segment. Bajaj Auto, which is the largest two wheeler manufacturer in India and the largest exporter of two wheelers to African countries, already has an electric scooter model. Many of you, those in India, would have heard about it called the Bajaj Chetak Electric, selling commercially in India. So this can be a quite a unique appliance category where, uh, uh, where electric appliance category where large scale manufacturers can play a role in the off-grid sector and help reach the scale that other productive use off-grid appliance companies have not been able to because traditionally they've been dominated by social startups. Uh, next slide, please. So 
So uh, what is the link with circularity, circular economy or e-mobility? Uh, so I and many of so circular economy is basically a circular flow of models. So it's not, you know, it's not just produce, use and then throw away. It's trying to move away from it to get out, get to a more circular flow. And so it is less intensive on the environment. So I and many of my colleagues back at ESD are big proponents of circular economy as a means to achieve a low carbon world. And e-mobility applications for rural, rural areas lend very nicely to several circular economy strategies. Uh, I'll explain uh, in this slide. I've outlined some of them, uh, you know, in this slide. Uh, I will add that it is not, uh, it is always important to look at circular economy or CE strategies together for an application rather than focusing on a single isolated circular economy strategy as many circular economy strategies compete with each other or are in conflict. So the first here is user oriented product service systems or PSS models where they are called where customers pay for temporary access to a particular product uh, typically through a short or long term agreement while the service provider retains full on ownership of the product. We are all very familiar with this model vehicle as a service. Um, you know, uh, I mean, Minigrid as a service has always been existed. Uh, Vijay uh, has been doing it for a number of years, so have many other ESCOs. Um, uh, vehicles as a service model all, is already quite popular in the mobility sector and is a great example of a circular economy business model. The idea is that it intensifies the use of a single product or a single vehicle in a vehicle sharing model in lieu of spreading use across several products. And so you'd be using less ores, less polymers, less biomass from the environment and reducing the overall carbon footprint. Vehicle as a service uh, model is an important strategy to solve the rising demand for vehicles and heavy congestion and pollution in urban regions. In rural areas, however, this circular economy business model strategy is equally important as an affordability solution alongside being a circularity solution because you know a fee-based solution helps reduce burden of heavy upfront and ongoing costs in appliance sales based models so um, a variant of this model will be batteries as a service seen seen in many battery swapping models for example so you can sell the vehicle but retain the battery ownership a scheme that was piloted by mahindra for example in bhutan with the reva cars um, and in the energy access world a german german based startup called batteries.com uh, and I'm speaking more conceptually because my understanding is that they are in early scale pilot stages. But what they have is a docking module for vehicle charging and have a stackable modular battery design that goes on top of each other like Lego pieces, which is also multi multi-purpose. So you can lease out batteries for, for e-vehicles, but also for other use cases um, and, and do it that way. Um, then the second circular economy strategy are product life extension strategies. So this basically means that you design your vehicle or e-mobility e e vehicle uh, for high durability or high repairability, which will help retain vehicle value by keeping it in use longer. This actually links in quite nicely with the previous circular economy business model that I explained, the service-based vehicles one. This is because if you look at the greenhouse gas emissions generations during the three phases of any electrical appliance, so its production phase, its use phase, and its end of life phase. For products that have low emissions impact during use phase, because they are either more energy efficient or have low utilization rate, but have high emissions impact in production phase. Circular economy strategies for life extension are very beneficial because you want to have a low product replacement rate. On the other hand, if the emission impact in use phase are significant, and if technological improvements lead to reduction in those impacts, it may be better to replace products quickly. Um, and so um, in e-vehicles as a service model, because you're really enabling high use intensification and it is already electric, you would want to extend lives as much as possible. So I need to conclude quite quickly because we are short in time. Uh, local assembly is pretty straightforward. Uh, because, uh, you know, it will it will make the sector more resilient to global chain supply shocks that happened during COVID, for example. Uh, you can use uh, adopt conversion based uh, vehicles effectively because of bad terrains in many rural remote areas in sub-Saharan Africa and India. Uh, you can take locally available durable ICE vehicles that are designed for, for those geographies and make them electric instead uh, of, of uh, you know, taking uh, more state-of-the-art electric vehicles um, and then the the next one is upcycling 
Uh, so, which is similar to giving a second life to batteries from end of life electric vehicles or other appliances uh, and using uh, them for e mobility applications. So, um, uh, and uh, one of the one of the biggest things I think that India can do would be to set up a lithium ion battery recycling industry, which is also referred to as urban urban mining, um, and that can really promote the EV sector in, in rural India, for example. The last is use of IoT and power electronics in promoting circularity and resiliency. EVs are also easily amenable to use of IoT. An emerging option for modular products is to embed sufficient electronic monitoring into the product to predict the expiry of different modules based on the use history, something we have seen sufficiently in pg based models in energy access. And use of IoT also helps promote resiliency because of, you know, you can enable contactless payments during times of pandemics. Uh, last slide, please. So I'd like to end by saying that e-mobility in rural areas holds a lot of promise, both from a productive impact point of view as a resiliency strategy and environment impact. And we're quite excited to start to think jointly on this problem with the manifold. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richa. Uh, very enlightening presentation uh, and all the dots of circularity uh, that can really guide forming best practices to scale up EVs in rural. Uh, with that, uh, uh, I now request our first uh, uh, panelist, uh, Shanta Blumen uh, from Africa, uh, to share uh, her experience and working in Africa and uh, what e mobility scale up uh, she believes is possible in rural. Shanta. For that thank thank you very much i'm very honored uh to be here today and be um part of a south south discussion i think what richia said about uh bringing china and india and africa and, and sharing experiences is really really important um just to, to qualify um i have a startup uh that we started two years ago in zimbabwe obviously africa's you know, 54 countries and um, a very, very big continent. Um, so I, I obviously don't feel qualified to represent everything going on, um, but I have over the last two years obviously been scouring as much information as I can about those working in this sector. But um, today I'm obviously going to give you a bit of an overview and then focus on our experiences in rural Zimbabwe. Um, uh, it was suggested that I start with a video, so I'm going to take you to rural Africa and just give you a quick taste um, of, of what we're doing there. Let me just press on. We're testing the usage of an electric tricycle for women in agriculture in Zimbabwe. We're looking at transforming lives of these women by bringing the electric vehicle revolution to Africa. And we decided that rural women should not be bypassed by this opportunity. Through the, the application of the funds, we'll be able to expand our pilot and get a wider reach and a wider sample that can help us to establish whether we've got the right product for the environment, as well as improve on the technology of the batteries that we're using. We are successful when we have a thriving agricultural community that has gender balance, so women are earning as much as the men are doing, and actually 80% of the food that is consumed in Africa is produced by small-scale farmers, and these are the people we're looking to empower. Okay. Uh, excuse me, sorry, sorry, my yeah. technology is not good. Um, so that just gives you a taste, as I said, of what we're doing in Zim. Um, we, we decided we really wanted to focus on women, and I'll explain more, but I think um, we all know they're often at the bottom of the pyramid. And what we wanted to do was start with them and prove that um, they could indeed learn to master three-wheel tricycles and, and could also um, benefit. Um, I won't cover what's already been spoken, and I know most of you are all well-versed in the link uh, between energy access, the SDGs and mobility. But I think just to underscore that it's it, mobility is critical for so much social and economic development. Um, and in Africa, it's particularly acute because we still face 
uh, a really huge infrastructure deficit and uh, with, with really a shortage of, of roads, um, but especially off-road transport links. Um, so in a continent this big, paved roads are one area, but in, 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 in the rural area, when you go off the main road, there are huge numbers of people living that are depending um, on livelihoods linked to agricultural productivity. And for them, transport, I believe, is, is, is catalytic uh, for unlocking their potential. Um, it, I, I've lived and travelled in, in, in Asia and, um, I mean, I think, to be frank with you, the, the bajaj and the tuk-tuk transport is, is much more ubiquitous. In rural Africa, we still face huge numbers of people walking long distances. Um, women es spend an estimated 40 billion hours a week, uh, a, a year, just carrying things. Um, we have, as I said, a huge problem where people are disconnected from main roads uh, by long distances from their village. So they still, if they're going to take their crops to the market, they're going to need to get to that main road or the main feeder town so then it can be transported uh, to a larger market in a city. Um, so this is a huge potential, unexplored, un, 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 uh, an area that there is just enormous demand. Um, 60 to 70% of the population in Africa is still rural. Um, obviously, there's a huge move to urban because people want access um, to modernity and they want jobs. Um, and I, I think that we have to be serious about how we invest in rural livelihoods to make it more attractive for young people to see their future there. Um, and then needless to say, I, I spent 20 years working in development and the link to uh, social and economic outcomes in health and education are obvious. I think the challenge has been that we really haven't had a ready-made solution. Uh, you know, we've tried bicycles, we've tried other types of transport, um, but essentially it hasn't been uh, sustainable or catalytic in the way I think the potential of EV micromobility can be. Um, I, I think I've been in this space for the last two and a half years and it's incredible. Um, there is a, a, a realisation now that we really could transform lives in rural areas um, through both the huge advances in renewable energy. So there's a lot of investment going on, specifically in mini grids um, and energy access. I think in some ways this has been disconnected. The conversation has been disconnected from those in the productive use energy space, but especially in mobility. There's still a lot of reticent and feelings that uh, e-mobility requires too much energy and, um, and won't be sustainable. The focus has been on household energy consumption. Um, but, but as I keep on hearing from my, our customers, you know, having a light to study at night is critical, but if I can't pay the school fees and increase my income, then I'm not going to solve the problems I need. Um, I think the pay-as-you-go model that's been used, though, in, uh, in the household solar kit expansion um, has proven that with digital technology, digital mobile money, um, people will pay for services if they're given the right access to financing and to pay over time. And, of course, battery storage, the costs are coming down. Um, there, there is no reason that we can't leverage the huge investments that are going in OEMs to be adapted for uh, poorer rural communities. It's not that the, the technology and the innovation doesn't exist. Um, so just, I won't go through all these details, as it was pointed out, obviously East Africa um, is home. There are a lot of three-wheeler and two-wheeler taxis um, being used mainly in urban areas, but increasingly petrol driven in rural areas. Uh, my argument is always, why don't we just skip petrol and jump to electric like we've done with some of the, the digital mobile phone. We didn't have landlines, why don't we just skip? And to be frank with you, petrol, um, for, is not just part of the climate change crisis, but it's also um, essentially a huge challenge. It's imported in most countries, it's expensive, 
It's not easily accessible in rural areas. And I have seen plenty of broken down vehicles or vehicles that are sitting in a rural area with no petrol um, to use and um, or motorbikes with no petrol to use. So it really is not just about having the having the vehicle, but it's but it's how is it going to be serviced? And we know that EV is much more cost effective uh, to maintain. Um, so our focus is very much on micro mobility and the last and first mile delivery. Um, once again, that's where the, the hugest need is. It's where women especially spend hours doing backbreaking work. And um, what we're, we're testing is, uh, I'll talk about that in a moment, but, but how do we, we lift that burden and the time and productivity spent? Um, as I mentioned before, there is a huge investment going on in the energy access space. A lot of governments are also looking at how they convert to renewable to service their grid energy. There are a lot of initiatives around rural electrification. Um, on a, the, the estimates vary between 600 and 650 million uh, Africans without regular access to electricity. Uh, there is a huge problem. I'm sitting in Johannesburg. We face load shedding, uh, even in a sophisticated uh, metropolis like this. So there is a huge need for more investment, but it is coming. And um, I think that's really the next chapter is how do we focus on rural areas and rural electrification, but also being smart. Um, so we don't necessarily need to make sure every house is wired in a remote rural area if we can use the technology around battery storage and battery swapping to service energy needs, especially linked to productive use um, applications. Um, so, I mean, the good news is that the figures are moving. Um, but we still do face huge challenges. And we also obviously need to create um, the productive use energy case so that those renewable energy investments in rural areas and in mini grids continue. Um, because obviously a lot of the mini grids are still struggling with how they sell enough power um, to, to, to make it viable. Um, mobility for Africa, I, as I said, I spent 20 years in, in development, so I don't come with an engineering degree to this problem. I come very much focused on the, the social impact that mobility means. And having not seen any change in this space, going to rural villages in 20 years and wondering why hasn't this problem been addressed? So uh, the pilot we launched was actually um, in partnership with some students from China and some students in Zimbabwe. And we really did want to just start experimenting with, with what exists and what works and how do we adapt it to the off-road African context. So um, we, we've renamed the Sandlacher, which is the three-wheel tricycle in China. So we started with an off-the-shelf um, vehicle from China um, and we've obviously we didn't we, we, we now are looking to how do we improve this tricycle for off-road rural conditions how do we make the wheels stronger how do we uh, design it so it's user friendly from the women um, why we chose this model is because it's very functional um, and first of all women don't need to straddle a lot of our focus groups told us that women don't like to, to, to they don't feel safe riding a, a bicycle or a motorbike. Uh, they, they often wear skirts. So this is a perfect compromise. Their feet are on the ground. They don't need to, you know, to straddle and show their legs. And the vehicle itself can carry up to 400 kilos. So this is perfect in rural Africa if you need to carry your crops and your children and everything else. Um, we obviously, it's been much more um, challenging and difficult um, on, on the technology front. Um, we, we, we started with local assembly, we trained local technicians, we had um, Chinese technicians come, we set up a factory in Harare, we have lobbied the government. Um, in Southern Africa, the regulatory space is very unclear. 
in East Africa, there's obviously, as I said, a lot of regulations for three wheelers, but in Zimbabwe, there's none. So we are, we've, we've managed to get some tax exemptions for local assembly. Um, and obviously in China, these batteries relied on lead acid batteries because that's the cheapest um, battery and these are servicing the, the poorest people in China. But obviously in China, rural electrification and power is cheap. Um, so what we have, we were in our second phase of our pilot now and we're working on obviously uh, lithium battery solutions and we, we, we're using a battery swapping model. Um, so we actually built a charging station um, with off-grid solar energy, um, which I will tell you is still not perfect and doesn't require, doesn't produce enough energy, but um, we're learning every day and we're now, you know, tapping into the technology to make sure we have a replicable model. Um, our major focus is how do we prove that rural African women are viable um, for an investment like this? Um, there's obviously a lot of scepticism that says that people that earn less than $5 a day are too poor. But what we know from our research is that people, households spend a lot of money on transport. Even if they don't earn much money, uh, you know, up to 50% can be spent on transport. So we've been proving that there is a, a business case and that women will spend money um, on transport. And we've got, we've just set up a transport and logistics service. We're very interested in shared users uh, models and, and that is, is, is working to, to cater to the huge demand that exists. So obviously maybe not every household or individual can, can, can have a tricycle or afford a tricycle, but they can at least benefit. Um, as I said, the battery technology is evolving. So we've been improvising. Uh, we're now in the process of designing a charging station where we could basically try and service a hundred tricycles. Um, and, and this talk to me in six months and hopefully we will, we will have this second uh, site operational and we'll have all the technical solutions solved. Um, but I believe that battery swapping is, it could be transformative and obviously the potential of batteries to be used for then multi-purpose. It could be used for the transport, it could be used for the water grind, the water pump, the grinder. It can, it can, it can be used in a household and um, really be the, the, the great game changer. Um, we've also been busy trying to sort of track um, transport needs. So we've got a GPS online system and we've just created a booking system uh, for, for our shared user model. Uh, so we're obviously busy trying to demonstrate that the informal rural economy in Africa can be viable for investment, which I, I obviously um, believe very much in, but it, it's a constant challenge to try and to convince others that we can leapfrog progress now uh, and invest. Um, we have lots of amazing women in our, uh, as customers and part of our pilot experience and each one of them has demonstrated how they can change their life with mobility. Um, our oldest participant is 68 years old. We have a driving course. We teach all the women how to drive. And um, so it's amazing to also have these rural women empowered and, and the gender shift is enormous because at the moment only the women are allowed to drive the tricycle. So essentially it means the men um, have to defer to them if they, if they need a lift, which, which I think is, is, is helping to shift gender stereotypes and norms. So I'm gonna stop there and, and, and look forward to questions and, and thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Shanta. Uh, definitely very uh, inspiring. Uh, and as Richa and you uh, kind of brought out uh, South to South cooperation, India has extreme uh, experience and very uh, high quality uh, development has gone into battery swapping. And uh, uh, since I understand a lot of your problems were around the battery management uh, uh, and mileage efficiencies and business model, 
uh, I think that is definitely an area that uh, EST and P Manifold would really like to uh, help and support uh, Shanta. Uh, with that, uh, let me welcome uh, uh, Siddharth uh, from Celestial, uh, another brave entrepreneur who have gone ahead, uh, take the bulls by horn and uh, actually picked up a tractor application uh, which really uh, forms a very, very central part of the rural economy for uh, agricultural produce to transportation and uh, uh, actually electrifying it and already tested it. So with uh, thousand orders uh, in hand, let's see like uh, 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 what Siddharth has to share uh, uh, with us. Siddharth. Hey, thanks for the introduction, uh, Rahul. Uh, so I'm Siddharth. Uh, uh, glad, uh, glad that Rahul could uh, resonate with a bull and a horn. So what we built is a electric tractor, and that's exactly what I am going to talk about today and show what we have done here. So Celestial uh, Immobility is the organization that we founded uh, a year ago and uh, the name speaks uh, speaks it all so we want something out of the world at the same time we want it to be something that can resonate with the price sensitive market so incidentally at the early part of the conversation uh, rahul did mention about a very critical question while putting us preload across why electric mobility in rural india and which was also resonated by uh, Shanta uh, in her uh, presentation. Interestingly, we are talking about a price sensitive market, but a very quick and a very enterprising thing, at least for the rural India right now is, it's a restricted use case. Uh, the way uh, Rahul did demonstrate that the number of kilometers or something that has been driven within the restricted use case of a rural uh, population, is a very good case for, for us to build a electric mobility. So here is the product that uh, we have built. So let me unveil and then show you what we have. So this is the top level table of contents that I will dwell on. I will talk about what uh, Celestial is all about, why electric tractor. Uh, very interesting part of the conversation will revolve around the total cost of ownership and its uh, product map. Because the moment we say electric, everybody jumps out of their chair saying that, hey, I got a shock. It's twice the price of a fossil fuel. That should not be the case. So we will talk about the total cost of ownership as well. And uh, yeah, we will talk about our unique uh, trademarked idea called EHAT, uh, which actually fits uh, perfect in uh, rural uh, India as well as the African uh, environment, which uh, Shanta presented as well. So this is the team of four people uh, uh, who built this electric tractor. Yet uh, to take the bull by the horn, we had to have a lot of gray, gray hairs or no hair on our head, and which is what we did. Uh, so uh, all the four of us come from four different backgrounds, which uh, fits in like a jigsaw puzzle. So I am from the engineering design background. My colleague Syed is from the battery design background. Uh, we know this from the tractor with 30 years of tractor e design experience and uh, Mithun is from the manufacturing expertise. So the design, the engineering, the battery capability, the tractor and the manufacturing capability put together is what you see as a product uh, in, uh, in front of you. And uh, yeah, one of the most powerful statement I would say is one tenth power rating of a diesel but equivalent in its performance. So this is how it looks. So we know a tractor is for the rural India. It doesn't have to look boring and it doesn't have to look masculine. Uh, I am a supporter of women, so it definitely looks uh, uh, womanish, but yes, it has got all the power it needs. Here is a small uh, video about what and how the product was launched. So this is the tractor and this is how it works. So we have tested it for all kinds of conditions. It works on slash, it works on muddy, 
muddy terrain it works on loose soil uh, so if you typically look at it it has got all the elements of a perfect tractor what you see right here is it is hauling close to around seven people so the concept of the electric tractor right now you can see that uh, it has got a three point connection it has got a hydraulic uh, it's got a power takeoff and whatever uh, is the uh, trailer that you are seeing it is a trailer that is typically hauled by a 40 hp uh, tractor equivalent and what we have built is a, a sizing that makes all the difference at 21 hp equivalents so that's the biggest takeaway in our entire uh, conversation of building the e-tractor. It doesn't have, and it looks uh, pretty neat and it looks uh, urban vehicle with a rural application. So let me, let me get down to the numbers and facts uh, out here. So what you see right now in front of you is the uh, comparables between uh, three uh, different parlors, uh, though we want to call it as an apple to apple comparison, uh, but we have taken the bull by the horn because we are talking about comparing a diesel equivalent uh, in India by some of the large OEMs or the biggest OEMs. We are also talking about uh, a diesel equivalent in the North American market, which I am talking about an advanced economy. And we are also talking about uh, one other electric prototype that has been there in the North American market, which is supposed to be an equivalent or a competition to what we have built. So if you look at all the parameters, so all of them are at a 20 horsepower equivalent. Uh, the dimensions are more or less same. The ground clearance, everything is same. But if you look at the kind of hauling capacity or pulling capacity, the diesel equivalent does 1,200 kgs or 1.2 tons. And the diesel equivalent in US does 1.1. And the electric does 0.75 or 750 kgs while we are doing 1,500 kgs. So if you look at the rating or the power equivalence, we are actually more or less similar but our performance is equivalent to a 40 HP. And so the primary uh, purpose for a tractor to be used in an agriculture, this thing is its power takeoff or the PTO that comes at the rear of the tractor. So we have given two speeds, 540 and uh, 900 RPM. And if you look at the diesel equivalent or anything else, they are all at single speed. And here is the icing. So if you look at all these price points, uh, the diesel equivalents are all more or less the same, but if I go to a comparable 40 HP equivalents, we are at a price point of six, six and a half lakhs for a diesel, while we are actually one lakh cheaper than a diesel. And the competitive product that we have, which is a electric prototype in US, uh, is at fifty thousand dollars, while while we are at seven thousand five hundred dollars. So it. You, you can be green, but it doesn't have to pinch your pocket. To become environment friendly, you don't have to shell more money. And that's exactly what we are trying to precipitate out here. So here is the cost comparison. We are talking about a typical life of a, a total cost of ownership of a diesel tractor. You have seven years, 30,000 kilometers, or it is uh, uh, described in terms of number of working hours, which is 3,750 hours on an annual consumption of 500 hours. So you're talking about diesel consumption per liter at 1.1, while the electric, I'm talking about a commercial electric cost pricing at 0 0.08 per kilowatt utilization. And what does this translate to? Here it is. So we have the fuel cost adding up to $9,333 uh, uh, for a diesel equivalent in its uh, lifetime of seven years, but we are talking about just 800, that is less than one tenth of, or less than one hundredth of the consumption. So if you're 
directly equating it to the per hour uh, requirement of the diesel yes you are you are talking about 2.67 dollars per hour in comparison with 0.23 cents per hour and uh, maintenance yes it's pretty much zero we are talking about 400 plus uh, moving components or a sub assembly of a uh, fossil fuel to an equivalent of uh, electric where we have built less than 20 uh, sub assemblies and uh, uh, hardly any moving components the moving component out here is the motor uh, the i mean gearbox and the tires and uh, the axle and differential that's it uh, so like all my previous speakers said yes we we don't see a reason why the rural population shouldn't get a smart vehicle and it doesn't cost much to fit in a smart vehicle uh, in the hands of a rural population today if you look at the indian uh, rural population they are the maximum consumers of a mobile phone while it is supposed to be an urban thing but indians uh, have mobile phones in the rural population and they actually control the operations of their uh, pumps to pump water using the mobile phone so why not build a smart tractor for them and which is exactly where we are so here is a quick uh, roadmap on what we are trying to do so what you just saw is a, a equivalent uh, 21 hp so we are going to build a haulage for various versions we are already in uh, three more different uh, models we are at uh, 50 hp we are also at 210 hp we are talking about a very large uh, 25 ton haulage we are also doing automation on uh, implements we are also building a tractor with autonomous kit uh, which means a small farmer with a small area will be able to uh, run the tractor on an autonomous uh, mode and of course a sophisticated driver information system uh, which is already there uh, right now on a smaller scale so like i said this is the founder profiles we're talking about 20 years of experience in uh, engineering design 18 years of battery tech 15 years of machining and cast uh, castings so 30 years of tractor design and manufacturing and that's what we have come together and build the first uh, working prototype uh, which is tested uh, for various conditions across the rural uh, landscape so here here is our takeaway for uh, we are also coming up with this unique concept and we have trademarked this called eHut where the eHut uh, runs a, as a battery community center. I will go forward and show you a small way on how the tractor and its application in a eHut can happen. So let me play this for you. Since the dawn of time evolution has been consistent from celestial evolution of earth to biological evolution of humans in this journey technology has never been an exception machines infrastructure pharmaceuticals automotive and batteries batteries evolve over time in chemical compositions capacity weight and size this evolution has nurtured celestial e-mobility's idea to empower automotive and this empowerment unfolded the idea of e-tractor. Tractors come with a facility to switch batteries with great ease. And here comes the takeaway. We buy an e-tractor, not a battery. Confused? Here is where we introduce the revolutionary battery swappable model, eHut. eHut, a battery community that runs on both renewable and non-renewable energy, is the answer to every question ever raised on battery efficiency, battery life, and most importantly, unaffordability of e-tractors. For that matter, it is the answer to all the electric vehicles. And we do this by simply nullifying the impact of battery price on electric vehicles, which means reduced price of e-tractors and maximum utilization of battery life by utilizing the batteries to maximum potential. Upon reaching the battery discharge threshold, a farmer can simply approach the nearest e-hut, which also happens to be a socializing hub, Flash the NFC on phones or wallet and swap the discharge battery with a new one. Celestial e-mobility, we empower to prevail sustainability. Uh, like uh, one of my earlier speakers, Richard, did mention uh, of upscaling and uh, bringing in uh, a, a concept of a 
uh, low cost uh, grid power would also be uh, possible to charge to be charged for our uh, electric pro mobility product so irrespective our uh, tractor or the uh, electric tractor is built in such a way that including a conventional 15 amps socket that is available at a pump near a field in at the uh, farmer's location or he has a 15 amp socket at his home he will be able to charge it he will able he will be able to swap the battery for it and he will also be able to come up with that circular account economy which uh, the other speaker uh, richard was talking about it will really uh, find a complete uh, use case on the entire circular economy here is one concept of a single unit design that we are contemplating on building that single battery module pack that will all fit into a e hat environment wherein you can just go beat a electric tractor beat a electric bike or beat any other vehicle each and every bot battery module will be uh, designed based on the lithium ion battery cell that was built for a specific purpose say for example a tractor needs a high torque application so there is a battery pack that will be built according to that high torque requirement application so you just have to pin punch in your product requirement and you should be able to pull out a battery and then swap it for a fully charged battery into your uh, uh, electric vehicle and then keep moving so these are the numbers that we are uh, targeting for the next uh, decade or so so close to around 10000 tractors so there are hardly four oems in the uh, four to five large oems in the tractor space and we are just looking at less than 1% and that itself can be a major cost of uh, uh, i mean it will change the total cost of ownership of the entire market and the farmers will definitely feel empowered when i say empowered he can actually own a tractor and doesn't have to burn a hole in his pocket and doesn't have to burn a hole in our uh, atmosphere as well so this is truly a green farming thank you for your time thank you very much uh, siddharth uh, i think uh, definitely a great progress we have made and uh, we really look for a uh, a uh, good capture of the market that you are targeting and uh, wish you very strong performing uh, ev on real grounds uh, with that uh, uh, i invite uh, uh, colonel vijay bhaskar ji ex country director amlinda and now md of uh, hamara grid a new startup that uh, he has launched with his team and uh, really focusing uh, on energy access and uh, uh, one thing i need to say that back in 2012 when reva was very early uh, into e mobility uh, it was that time when he was working in sundarbans uh, rural remote and uh, he actually got uh, implemented reva for uh, rural applications so since then he has been eyeing opportunity and uh, luckily that we got uh, hold of him and uh, we actually said that sir we will work with you to make it happen now with hamara uh, vijay ji yeah thank you very much uh, rahul uh, and richard well for for this opportunity uh, and i think between shanta and siddharth they covered a whole lot of ground so i, I won't take so much of your time i i'll just uh, cover my presentation in the form of a short story uh, of what 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 we tried to do over the last seven eight years, and uh, what are the lessons for us, and how uh, how we can take this forward. Um, you have a next slide, please. So uh, we started work uh, in the Sundarbans uh, in 2011. Uh, on a project that was to do with uh, reversing environmental degradation in the Tiger Reserve and the adjoining islands. Uh, we worked at a place called Rojabandha uh, Puth, and uh, one of the uh, flagship projects there was about uh, replacing uh, the 80 diesel uh, rickshaws, which you can see on the screen. Um, yeah, the, the diesel rickshaw was to be replaced by uh, these electric vehicles. We worked with um, uh, an electric car company called Reva, Bangalore-based, 
they helped her design uh, a vehicle which was uh, to replace this this um, diesel rickshaw but only the personnel part of it the cargo was uh, was a bit of an issue now these islands if you uh, look at the sundarban islands they are about 100 square kilometers uh, size they are large islands with two ferry points on either side and the these vehicles the diesel rickshaws as public transport sort of um, serve as a as a means of movement for the interland uh, of the island to the two ferry points now since these uh, islands are not connected to the electric grid uh, we set up a series of uh, solar pv charging stations in order for us to charge these electric vehicles so the, initially the, uh, the the route length was about 30 kilometers and the charging would take place by night at these charging stations now uh, in order for the charging to carry on uh, during the daytime as well and when they reach the ferry points we set up uh, with the help of uh, reva uh, two uh, solar panels on top of the vehicle which would then be uh, charge the batteries by trickle charge when the vehicles were waiting uh, sidb uh, a bank uh, a public sector bank in india did the product finance for these for the operators and reva trained a course of mechanics and set up a series of spares on these islands we created a bit of a repair ecosystem and tried to run this for 80 vehicles. Uh, over a period of time, the, the project started uh, was flag, started flagging because of certain issues with the OEM part of it. And uh, the locals then came to us and said that, can, they, can we give them electricity uh, from these charging stations? So what started out as an electric vehicles project, uh, you know, became a mini grid, a micro grid project. And this uh, sort of, uh, you know, grew over a period of time, shifted from 36 villages in the Sundarbans to a place called Burulia, uh, adjoining Jharkhand, and then moved into Jharkhand in three uh, three districts, where uh, it evolved into a mini grid project. So over the last about four years now, we're working in uh, a district called Gumla in Jharkhand on mini grids. The average size of these grids is about 25 kilowatt peak. Out of the project size of 50 grids, uh, we managed to set about 40 grids that are up and running uh, for the last about three years now. Now, these grids supply 24 by 7 three phase electricity and are designed mainly for productive loads for livelihoods and commercial loads, and very little 20% uh, of it is for domestic consumption. Now, over the last, uh, once you set up the grid in these very remote villages, it takes time uh, to reach 100% capacity utilization. Now, a 25 uh, kilowatt plant can supply about, in this, in, in Jharkhand, around 80 to 90 units of electricity in a 24-hour cycle. Uh, but it, initially, when the grids are, grids are, when energy access is provided to these villages, the entrepreneurial, uh, uh, you know, exposure is extremely low. And uh, some of these villages have actually been trading in barter and not using currency in the village hearts. And therefore, it takes time for us to work with these villagers in order to develop various businesses, uh, micro businesses, and in some villages which are really, really not, uh, don't measure up to the uh, entrepreneurial kind of a, uh, you know, potential. We need to set up end-to-end -end businesses in these villages, uh, link them with markets as well. And over a period of time, uh, uh, the, the really, really remote villages take almost like two to three years to reach there. And the very good villages, which are well connected, good communication systems and so on, uh, can do it in on four to six months time. And all of the 40 villages that we have, about 10% of them, about four to five villages, uh, have reached more than 100% uh, capacity utilization in less than six months. And they've had to be upgraded to the next level and to the next level. So what started out as a 25 kilowatt peak grid, now is about 140 kilowatt peak grid in these very good villages. The average village has utilization of energy between 40 and 60 percent. This means out of about 80, 90 units that are produced in a day, consumption is in the region of 40 to 50 units. But there are some villages which are absolutely at the lower end of the spectrum, uh, very poor villages, very remote villages, uh, and very low on the entrepreneurial ground. Now these villages now, for a for a uh, for an organization which tries to be commercially viable, this is a moral a kind of a philosophical question: whether should you go in for a for a village like this? We decided that all uh, you know villages should be given an equal opportunity to develop, and therefore we took on these villages as well. 
Now, one of the alternatives that are available to us besides uh, incubating micro enterprises in these villages, uh, financing uh, agri processing machinery like wheat milling machines, uh, rice hullers, uh, pulverizers, masala grinders, cold stores, and so on, we also uh, decided that uh, an, an ecosystem of electric vehicles uh, in, a, in this cluster of grids would work very well. Since we already had an experience on electric vehicles in the Sundarbans, it was easy for us to sort of understand how to go about this. Now, generally in a grid, uh, we used to have something called an anchor load, which really is a very large load, could be a telecom tower or a, a large agri processing machine, which contributes to almost 20 to 40 percent consumption in the village. But we found that the benefits of these anchor loads generally go to the entrepreneur and don't get evenly distributed across the village. And especially the gender wise, there is a huge disparity on how this profits or how these beneficiaries uh, you know, happen. And therefore, we came up with the concept of swarm loads, where, which are actually a large number of diverse loads, both agri and non agri, farm, non farm, seasonal, non seasonal kind of loads, which across the board, about 30 to 40 percent of the village could be entrepreneurs. And one of the things that we looked at was electric vehicle battery charging. So we set up these vehicles, as you can see, uh, basically um, transport for transport and started running them as school buses initially. And then a few entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs started taking this on. Now, the economics works something like this. The, for a grid to become, uh, uh, to start paying for itself, I mean, to become, to break even takes about anywhere between seven years to nine years. So the initial capex is about three euros per watt peak. So if you have a grid of about 30 kilowatt, it's almost like 90,000 90, euros uh, for, for a single grid. And even char the electricity charges there through a prepaid system is all, almost like uh, half a dollar cent uh, on, a, on an average per, per unit. Uh, though the price is very high in, as compared to the uh, government electricity, almost 10 times what the government electricity costs, what we actually do is to work with these communities in order to improve their economic, uh, uh, in, improve, improve the GDP of the village and their personal incomes. So we, over the last four years, we've been able to increase their personal incomes by between 20 and 22% year on year. And this is what helps them to sort of pay uh, for the electricity. Now, when you look at a cluster of grids of about 40 to 50 villages, the, every village has got a spare capacity in a 24 hour cycle of about 20 to 30 units. And you'll find that in the cluster of grids, you have almost like 1,000 units, 1,000 kilowatt hours of energy available. So I think uh, Shanta will be able to tell us that I think almost like a 200 batteries can be charged with this kind of energy availability. So this sort of gives us a use case for rural e-mobility uh, built on a cluster of grids. So what is this? Uh, do you think there are going to be a very large number of mini grids in India? I think uh, things are going to move in that direction at some point. Because though uh, India today, almost 99% of the villages are connected to the, to the national grid, the performance in the area where we work, and which is generally the case in most of rural India, is that eight to 10 hours of electricity, and in some very good states like Gujarat and Maharashtra, it will be something like 10 to 12 hours, 14 hours of electricity. But the quality of electricity and the reliability and the randomness is what eats into this whole thing. And they're not, and businessmen are not able to sort of, uh, potential entrepreneurs are really not able to uh, uh, sort of make a business plan based on availability of electricity. And the, the voltage is generally between 110 and 180 volts as against 230 volts. And as to which time of the day, these eight hours to 10 hours, in the 24 hour cycle, the electricity will be available, something that you can't predict. So that is the issue today in India. And so we see mini grids as a, as a potential solution to, to integrate with the grid and work in conjunction with the grid. And therefore, if that were to happen, today there are almost like 500 mini grids in India, mostly in the northern states, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand, and Orissa. But I think this is going to spread over a period of time. So if you want to look at a, if you want to look at a use case based on, uh, I mean, based on energy access and mini grids, uh, the, this is the feedback that we got from the communities, from the rural communities, that they need a cargo vehicle uh, in, as priority over a personnel, personnel vehicle. But like Shanta's uh, uh, Amba, we, I think we need to make something that can double up as a personnel vehicle as well. Uh, a cluster of micro mini grids is required to make to ensure the uh, 
the battery swap uh, facility works in an efficient manner because you will need to move batteries from grid to grid where, where energy is available uh, you know as a uh, as a spare that's not being utilized by the village and therefore this this energy can be sold at a very cheap rate because that's the marginal cost will be extremely low so a battery swap facility is a must vis-a-vis -a, -vis a charging station because you need to create a large number of charging station charging stations otherwise and um, this uh, thing about range um, anxiety is extremely high when you look at a, a rural area so there's nothing really in between the village and the town you need to create a repair and maintenance ecosystem you need to train operators and mechanics and this whole thing has to work as one ecosystem and most importantly product finance is a must and the grids only would be part of the charging infrastructure i'll close up now because i think we're short on time back to you rahul thank you very much uh, uh, vijay ji you were so sharp on time and you covered pretty much everything not leaving much to ask questions also uh, but i i, I really uh, like uh, you actually went from evs to microgrid and now we are pulling you from uh, microgrid to evs and we really hope that evs become that base load for your microgrids to kind of really make microgrids uh, uh, viability and full capacity utilization uh, in less than 6 months uh, from starting a microgrid uh, vijay ji so that i think is what uh, p manifold and est are committed uh, to work with you and uh, uh, make it uh, uh, happen I also liked uh, that you brought a very important uh, data point that with a 25 kilowatt peak uh, microgrid, uh, there can be a spare 25 to 30 kWh uh, uh, capacity on a daily basis. That is almost equivalent to uh, 10 e uh, rickshaws operating a 3 kilowatt hour uh, battery pack and doing almost 50 to 60 kilometers a day. So I think uh, that uh, I think uh, is uh, really doable and could cater to uh, village uh, transport needs. So that I think uh, I would really thank uh, uh, speakers. Uh, me and Richa have a few questions. Uh, we would limit our questions to allow us uh, taking more questions uh, from our uh, audience. I do encourage uh, audience to keep sharing uh, uh, their uh, questions and we will uh, take it. Uh, my my first question, I think across all three uh, of you, uh, battery swapping uh, idea as a core element of making this uh, EV use cases viable, be it Humba in Africa or uh, e-tractor uh, uh, in uh, uh, India and other applications uh, including cargo and others which uh, Vijayji pointed. Uh, battery swapping is coming as an important, uh, uh, significant uh, piece to really make the economics work. Uh, what kind of standardization of battery pack uh, for rural applications uh, uh, that can be uh, looked into? Uh, so like in uh, maybe Shanta can go first with her experience of what size battery packs uh, she is using for battery swapping. In India, Shanta, like a one and a half to two kWh battery pack, has uh, is being getting used uh, and uh, between multiple applications, and is kind of evolving as a uh, good standard for battery swapping for light vehicles. So, do you think that a one and a half kWh to two kilowatt hour battery pack uh, could become a uh, uh, could meet the need for battery swapping, Shanta? Yeah, look, I think the challenge is a couple of things. Um, one is, you know, rural requires more distance. So um, I think if you have batteries, we've been experimenting where you could use two batteries if you need to go longer distance and you switch en route. Um, so that's one challenge in, in rural Africa, distances are, are further. So 50 kilometres is useful but people want most probably more. So getting the battery size right. The other thing we've realized is obviously there's a huge market now in this battery area, but finding durable um, casing, the right connectors. I mean, we've been improvising. So we've learned the hard way um, on 
we need this adapter, no, this adapter doesn't work, it burns through. Um, obviously, you're on off-road, so you have the problem of um, vibrations. You've got lots of manhandling because people are putting a battery in and out of the Humber. So, so at the moment, what we're really doing is take taking that research and seeing how we can find the right battery partner um, to be able to make something that's durable for also the heat extremes, you know, um, and and the and the sort of rough handling. Um, and and so we so at the moment we've got sort of a steel casing, but we we didn't design. We we took off the shelf. So so to be frank with you, we've learned what doesn't work. But I think I think there's many aspects to the batteries in addition to how much energy they need to charge. Um, but I think to me, um, you know, it's it's making something that can last and be multi-purposed um, for at least fifty to seventy kilometres, ideally. Okay, sure. Uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, Shanta, like uh, if, uh, when I say like a two uh, kWh pack, that is one battery pack, and usually for a e auto kind of a vehicle segment. Uh, we will actually be putting uh, uh, two of those and they can uh, easily give like a 60 to 70 kilometers uh, distance in rough loads and loading conditions. Uh, yeah. with, ours, with are three, ours are actually bigger. Uh, ours are three kilowatt. So we have a bigger size battery. Which one you use? Sorry, and what's the size? It's a three, a three kilowatt battery. So it's, it's heavy. Yeah. Okay. So it and takes, how do you use in a one vehicle? Well, at the moment we're just using one, and okay. it takes, and and it's also the issue of charging um, infrastructure. So we we're okay. increasing charging from a 12 amp, obviously, which is slow, to um, a 25 amp charging system. Uh, Siddharth, could you share some of your thinking process in? Uh, battery swapping structure that you are envisaging and especially uh, in light to the e uh, discussion which you mentioned uh, Siddharth. Uh, so the the way the standardization can work for the e is is uh, we come up with a standard one module say for example it could be 1.5 or 2kW uh, but there are uh, different uh, requirements of a uh, torque that needs to be considered. Say, for example, a uh, e-rickshaw ha has certain certain uh, capacity or the certain rated power that it needs to go. Uh, sure. So for different sizing of a motor, you need to have three different adapters uh, for low torque application, for medium and high torque applications. Uh, the battery sizing can be same, but the configuration and those things can vary based on the uh, motor uh, torque performance requirements. And then all of them can then again go into a singular stem based on whatever you need. You can actually pull that out as a single unit and all of them can be overlaid on top of the other. So, for example, I have a 7.2 kilowatt uh, battery pack in my tractor for a, such a huge tractor. I just have a sizing of a 7.2 kilowatt motor, which means the sizing of the motor is rise, which means my requirement of controller comes down. So if you actually do all those reverse calculations right, uh, a battery swap facility with the optimum build of a product, we will be able to uh, vanish or uh, uh, let let go of all the fossil fuels uh, in in the entire rural uh, landscape. Sure, uh, I think this uh, brings to a very important point, which I think Shanta tried to mention. Uh, where she has to do a lot of experiments which continue uh, in really trying to customize uh, the development for uh, kind of rough rural uh, uh, roads, weather and usage styles. Uh, even in a, uh, I would say, little simpler uh, urban setting, we have seen that very organized players, EVs, uh, and established ones, uh, they are far away in terms of the field performance uh, than the stated specs. 
Uh, so Siddharth, this question to you, like uh, uh, as a startup, when you are getting into it and uh, about to launch, uh, what kind of real uh, rural things you have really tested and applied into your product so that in real life use cases, uh, at least your battery range uh, and load delivery capabilities are really much closer to real uh, usage uh, scenarios on ground. Uh, so you, the question is to me, uh, Rahul. Yeah, yeah, Siddharth. Like, uh, how as an yes. OEM, you are ensuring that uh, your product uh, is really designed for uh, rural tough use, and uh, yes. especially in case of EVs, which are very sensitive to range and other issues, it really delivers uh, what you state as a spec uh, close to it in the real grounds, and not really following only the regulated uh, cycles, uh, Siddharth. Uh, so here, here is how we started our design thinking, Rahul. Uh, very, very simple problem statement. We want to build a rural uh, elect, uh, tractor which has matches all the specification of a conventional diesel tractor and still is cheaper than a diesel tractor, which is exactly what we achieved. So the market that we have is price sensitive, so it's cheaper than a diesel. The performance we haven't compromised on any of the performance criteria. So uh here's what is our diesel tractor uh here is a diesel tractor and here is our electric tractor you do one-to-one -one comparison all the components are same but for the engine and the electric propulsion so typically the entire product is tested for all abuse conditions so when you remove the electric track electric propulsion and uh, i mean when you remove the diesel uh, engine and have the electric propulsion in it what i just need to handle is the connection between my motor and the gearbox the rest is all proven product category it's it's off the shelf so strictly speaking my tractor is equivalent to an abuse condition tractor of any oem in the country or worldwide so sure sure and uh, i think i will also ask uh, vijay then uh, coming to shanta on this point shanta like uh, what would be your uh, uh, ask from an electric vehicle manufacturer uh, for your custom uh, rural applications, uh, let's say mix of cargo and personal thing. So what are something over and above an OEM has to do in his EVs for uh, rural applications? Maybe Vijay, you can go first and then uh, uh, Shanta can share uh, her experience and her ask from the uh, EV OEMs. Yeah, the, the, the feedback we, we got from the communities, especially, uh, was that they they really, really need a cargo vehicle. Um, they're not very, very concerned about the comfort level uh, for a personnel kind of a use, pure personnel kind of a use. So if you really look at uh, what what happens in, the, in these villages, uh, there are these shared auto kind of vehicles, and they are pretty large, and um, they supposed to carry about six to eight people and end up carrying maybe twice that number. And in addition to that, they would carry almost like 500 to kg, 600 kilograms of, of load, what they, what they would like to go and sell in the market and come back with the produce uh, from the market. It's kind of a barter that happens. So you take agricultural produce from your fields to the marketplace and then you buy what your requirement for the village and then get back. So it's shared by quite a large number of uh, number of people that's number one second the roads are pretty bad by that i don't really mean the condition of the road itself but it's it's more like it's not built to urban specifications so you'll find that the slopes and the turning radii and so on are, are fairly fairly steep by any standards and we found that it's sometimes uh, the, the vehicles that we use they were not really designed like siddhartha designed his vehicle or shanta may have designed hers humba but these were just bought off from from the from Ranchi. They were just being used as uh, trans, normal transport vehicles uh, for, for personnel. And these uh, it is really really difficult for them to uh, you know uh, negotiate these slopes. And sometimes we had to tell a couple of passengers to get down and then negotiate the slope. That's the second and third. I think uh, Shanta has already brought that out. It's about range. Uh, you really require some additional range to be built in, which really I suppose ultimately is about battery capacity and making the vehicle lighter or 
you know but you need a do need a rugged rugged kind of a vehicle in rural areas so it's a kind of a combination of these things yeah i'll over to shanta and maybe just to add quickly i agree with many of what you've already said i think the the road conditions and and the rest i think what's critical though is building local capacity um and building an ecosystem for repair supply maintenance um and 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 what's different obviously in this space is understanding not just um, renewable energy, but the battery technology. So what what what's exciting, but where there's a huge um, ecosystem that needs to be built in a way is around understanding um, the differences with a combustible engine and and an EV and how you manage a battery. And then in, on top of that, you want your rural communities to be able to fix the tire if it breaks or punctures and service it. So you need to have the repairs available you know the, the capacity to repair supply chain management to make sure you can get that done the oems know how to do this i mean and and i know even the bujaj uh, guys in in east africa are very very clever in how they supply to keep the the engines and and their motors working um but i think that that's an additional challenge in rural areas um so we're looking at both training people obviously within the community but then we're also looking to partner with a training school and how you could do a six weeks course um, and this is where we need help on how to understand this technology so that you're you can empower local communities and it's not in Zimbabwe, everyone loves to study and everyone's asked me, well, what course do we do? What course do we do? And there isn't courses. You know, this needs to be a very practical, hands-on application of, of understanding the, the science around batteries and, and EV. So I think there's huge scope to build that locally, which will make whatever your design issues are more sustainable. And we've already had the local welder decide you could put the roof on here. So you can you can you can obviously adapt and use local talent, but we need to first bring them into this ecosystem. Sure, that is great. I think that connects to some questions that uh, uh, Richa has. Uh, Richa. Thanks, uh, Rahul. Uh, my question is around local assembly and uh, mainly with Siddharth and Shanta. So Siddharth, you mentioned, uh, I believe that uh, the your truck, the e-tractor, the e sorry, is uh, you're locally manufacturing it. And uh, it is amazing the level of affordability you've, you've been able to achieve. It'd be great if you could explain a little bit on how you were able to get there and what are there really, in terms of components, are there really any components that you have to rely on for importing? Uh, to what degree you're locally manufacturing or assembling and how is the import duties and tariff structure set up to incentivize uh, e-tractors and broadly vehicle local productions in India and I have a similar question with Shanta I, I understand that you're pick, taking off-the-shelf components uh, to put things together uh, what has what was your experience um, uh, along the same lines So, uh, thanks, Richa. I think uh, uh, majority of the components uh, of a tractor are uh, literally off the shelf. So, I don't build the steering, I don't build the uh, tires or uh, hub or differential. So, we build the entire e-propulsion kit in-house. So, what what we mean by that is we built our own in-house battery design, and that's what led led us to the sizing of the controller and the BMS is our in-house design. So the only other component that has been imported is the motor. So that's where our design tech uh, happened. So we've spent close to around six months in uh, design thinking and just three and a half to four months in uh, the product build. The product has been built uh, ground up in Hyderabad in India. So I think uh, I'm proud to say that that's, that's what uh, led us to uh, come up with a tractor that is cheaper than a fossil fuel. So, thanks, Siddharth. Uh, Shanta, it'd be great to hear your story as well. Sorry, just to add. Yeah, no. So from the beginning, um, we we've been we want to do technology transfer. Um, but I but I suppose I started um, where I wanted to have immediate impact. So. We, as I said, we took off the shelf. We have a supplier um, 
that that we we we've used and he made modifications according to feedback um, and essentially we have train locals in how to do assembly obviously it's a fairly makeshift we can produce we can assemble four or five humbers a day um, and this is the second version of the humber well the first humber was off the shelf um, there is a lot more scope for obviously adapt adaptation and now we are looking how to best we do that design and engineering work uh, but what we wanted to first test was to, to, was this viable for women? Could it work? And and then and then go backwards. Um, I I know that in Africa there's a huge demand to create jobs. You know we need there's a young population they're eager to learn. So I think that's really really important. But I think I've had this conversation. We have to be honest. It's going to take a long time before we have a battery that we need that's that's efficient and cost effective in Africa. Um, so we, we have to we have to use the global supply chain and find things and then and then start building the local capacity as we go. So that's our approach. So we're very invested in local technology transfer and, and we want to leverage global engineering capacity. But we're not going to wait. Yes. Quick comment, Shanta, on, uh, on the course uh, that you mentioned for students. So one, one thing that I've been toying with an idea is to work with the universe. I, I mentioned before that uh, as part of LEA program, ESD manages the design challenge for universities, and we work with a lot of African universities as well. And we're now recruiting Indian universities like IITs and so on. So um, what I've been thinking was is to actually develop uh, a course or an elective on circular economy, which will include a module for local assembly. Um, and so, you know, uh, maybe maybe this this could be an interesting thing to work on together. Over to you, Rahul. Uh, there are some interesting questions in the chat room. Sure. Uh, uh, this is one question that is coming. I think uh, it, uh, definitely I think Shanta has some mention about it. Uh, how in rural application the batteries used in electric vehicles can also be uh, used for other appliances and other powering of other equipments. Uh, EST runs a very interesting uh, uh, low energy inclusive appliances program. Uh, Vijay, do you want to share your uh, understanding and uh, again what kind of specification because this will be additional to the current battery swapping uh, uh, standards that at least India has looked for specific targeted to EV applications. But when you start adding this, another requirement of this battery is getting used for powering some of the other appliances, including maybe a pump as well. Uh, so what kind of additional things has to be looked into uh, to really uh, evolve a right kind of a strong battery, which Shanta is asking? Vijay? Yeah, sorry. Um, so uh, you're looking at alternate applications uh, for the battery uh, once once it's uh, charged and maybe not used in the uh, EV. Is that your question? Uh, that is Rahul? right. That, uh, yeah, I think we need to look at uh, uh, what you guys were talking about. Uh, about uh, you know, I, I think there's some work that's going on which you talked about in pre-manifold about. I think having a, uh, you know, a, a kind of a, a, a DC AC agnostic kind of a plug. So if you are going to uh, have a system by which uh, uh, the device or whether the whether the, uh, the plug itself, uh, you know, have some kind of a application by which an automatic conversion can happen. Because today uh, the DC applications in the field are very very limited at the moment. And uh, in spite of uh, a huge encouragement by the government on, uh, you know, DC, uh, DC, pump, DC pumping for irrigation and putting up a solar, uh, a standalone solar for that, it's really not taken off in a very big way. And uh, there's a lot of wastage uh, that's going on because it, the sharing between of these pumps are also becoming a big issue. So uh, unless there is something else that is going to be accompanied by uh, a, a DCAC conversion or a DCAC agnostic kind of a uh, thing, uh, it'd be very difficult for this to be a success in the rural baby work. I'm not very sure about, and I think that's much the case with the rest of rural India as well. 
it's a very ac driven thing uh shanta can you add uh, uh, your experience on use cases of uh, this evs batteries uh, for other powering other appliances in africa how is it currently getting used and what some of the opportunities you see and what some of the technical ask you have from the uh, suppliers so i'm um obviously not the engineer here i'm i just know that you there's some very smart people that can make this work in the sense that you know from what i understand you know we have we have power tools um we can we can you know i i feel like there must be a way that with the controller and the motor that we can adapt a motor and a battery for multiple purposes. We haven't yet been able to test that, but we have been exploring with our partner in, uh, we have a second life battery partner in Germany that has taken our tricycle and, and, and testing his batteries, but he's also now looking at how it could be interoperability with different devices. And so my idea is that you're in a rural area, you ideally have, you know, a mini grid or a, a charging, uh, it could be a, a plug and play model to a mini grid, but you have your charging station and you can have a power, a library of tools that people can borrow or rent for low cost when they need those productive, you know, whether I need the grinder, I don't need the grinder every day, so I can come, borrow the battery and, and, and the motorized device. So this is not yet in our field testing, but we're talking to um, our partners and hoping that you know we could test out that interoperability between multi-purpose batteries and motors. Um, my feeling is, you know, in Africa there's obviously a lot of investment now going into small scale appliances. Um, you know, refrigeration is obviously a big priority. Um, so so I, I I think it's just how do we adapt it. Um, and make a user case, a viable business case to get to get it out to rural areas, which which to me is is actually more challenging than the technology. I actually think the technology is 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 coming quickly, but I think as um Vijay said, the challenges in rural areas, we have to be patient. People are often poorer, and it requires a different measurement of success. If you're looking for just a quick instant, profit then you know you're thinking short term so I, I think it's how much we care about rural change ultimately and whether we're willing to be patient in a in, in, in the business model for a financial return uh, that's sure. not a direct answer sorry but I so there you go sorry I, I took it in another direction no, I think like uh, 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 I think uh, the use case established uh, what you and uh, Vijay are confirming that uh, just batteries in addition to EVs, if they can be used for powering other appliances, then uh, uh, it further uh, provides an improved energy access. And I think that uh, brings us to a conclusion uh, for today's webinar. We have gone uh, 15 minutes uh, over time. Uh, but I think like the opportunity definitely exists. Uh, both Siddhartha, Shanta and uh, Vijay has kind of uh, uh, really uh, strongly vetting that uh, EVs could really make a very strong impact uh, to the rural economy, uh, primarily driven by the logistic uh, and uh, applications. And uh, uh, because of uh, the, the charging problem can be solved, in conjunction with uh, local microgrid operator uh, working in uh, solar and renewable type things and also with the discom model now that discom has penetrated in 99 percent uh, situation so right business model has to be looked into it so i think like uh, uh, in our next series uh, joint with est on this topic we would explore other use cases uh, how a organized e-commerce player who sees market of doing with rural, uh, how EVs can solve uh, that kind of, uh, and opens up a very new market for these players and also the rural to really interact with the uh, urban uh, FMCG markets and much more. Uh, so with that, I think I would uh, uh, take opportunity to thank uh, uh, our participants for sharing interesting questions and being patient. Uh, I thank our uh, uh, wonderful speakers uh, sharing uh, uh, their so detailed perspectives 
and i hope they will be open for any questions coming from our participants uh, uh, with team manifold and esk are happy to collate uh, so please feel free to share your questions and uh, we will do our best in terms of answering them and sharing it uh, to our website so with that uh, uh, i again thanks uh, esk for joining uh, team manifold uh, uh, and doing this uh, joint initiative has hash grow evs in rural uh, i will add a word which shanta just mentioned with patience <laughs> to really ensure that uh, uh, we do it right uh, for the social impact uh, uh, that it has huge potential thank you everyone thank you thank you rahul thank you all the speakers it was truly i'm very very grateful that we were able to bring all of you together thank you thank you, thank you, thank you so much thank you